Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer, the site supervisor here at the South Broadway Library. Um, first off, I'd want to thank the Friends for the Public Library and the Library Foundation, for whom without their support and our funding, we would not have wonderful programs like we're going to have today. Um, and I would just like to introduce Amy Owens. She is a New Mexico certified beekeeper, and she is going to be talking with us about the ins and outs of the honeybee colony. Here she is. Hello. Um, so thanks for coming this morning. I love talking about bees, and it's even better when there's people that want to listen. So thank you. <laughs> um, but today we're going to focus on honeybees. Um, and so I was laughing earlier. I wrote a brief description in history, and I just got really into the history for whatever reason this time. So I hope you guys enjoy it. I like went way back because I have some really good things to pass around that kind of show like the ancient history of how the honeybee came about. So um, yeah, but anyways, so when we talk about bees, people just kind of automatically their minds go to honeybees, right? Um, and we don't think about like bumblebees, squash bees, carpenter bees, all these other bees that we have around us every day. And worldwide, there's actually 20,000 different species of bees that are in that apis family. And um, just in the United States here, we have um, 4,000 species of bees. And what's really cool is here in the Southwest, in our area in New Mexico, we have some of the greatest um, species diversity of bees. And does anyone know why a place like a desert, like where we're at, would have the greatest diversity of bee species? It's really cool, but I think a lot of people don't know this. These are longhorn bees. We have these um, here in Albuquerque in the East Mountains. Um, but anyway, so this is a map, and I'll tell you in a second why we have so much diversity here. But this is a really cool map of bee diversity um, concentration. So the yellow areas have a few species, you know, and then it gets orange, red, and then that dark, like almost black color is where there's the most species of bees. And if you look at like where New Mexico is, we're like that really dark, dark area. So we have a really wide variety of bee species here and it's really cool and the reason for that is because most bees actually dwell in the ground and if the ground is wet they can't thrive and do their thing because the ground is where they store their food babies um, all of those things and so they need dry bare ground like um, digger bees I don't know if y'all seen digger bees you haven't you should look it up because they're they look like little flying elephants and um they're so cute and we have them like everywhere so um but yeah they're a good example of bees that live in the ground and they have just like a little hole about that big that they go into and so um obviously that's not about honeybees but i think to understand the honeybee we need to know that it's only one of like twenty thousand species um and so apis mellifera so i didn't put anything about this on the slideshow because um i'm gonna pass around some things and you don't have to touch this if you don't want to but there's not a whole lot of people who pass it around hmm so yeah i'm just gonna pass it around if you i'll leave it in the bowl there that's what we'll do so um if you think like back just to like evolutionary biology of plants. Um, a long time ago when there were just ferns, um, you know, over 100 million years ago, um, we didn't have pollen on plants. It was just, that's not how they reproduced. And so we had wasps, but we didn't have bees. And um, wasps are predatory, so they eat protein, other bees, other bugs, um, aphids, there's some great predatory wasps like for your garden. Um, and so we didn't have any bees yet. And then about a hundred million years ago, when plants started using pollen to reproduce, they found out that it was beneficial. I say they found out, but you know, the plants that were producing pollen and reproducing with seeds did really well. And so they proliferated and then bees came about 
and then more and more bee species came about. And so long story short, bees actually descended from wasps. And so what I thought was cool, um, and I'm super nerdy, so I always save like weird things from outside, but this is just like um, a paper wasp nest. And if you look at it, it has the same, you know, shape as honeycomb, those hexagons, right? And so you can look at that and then you can look at bee comb and it's that same shape. So you just see all these little similarities and obviously we see flying bees and wasps and we don't always know with our naked eye which one they are. But also on this comb, I thought it was cool. You know those mud dauber wasps? There was a mud dauber that went into a hive that didn't have bees and it made a little mud tube on the honeycomb. I thought that was so cool. So I'll just pass this around just so you can kind of think about that ancient history of these cousins um, that we don't often think about. So, yeah. Okay. So anyways, Apis mellifera, that's the scientific word for a honeybee. Um, and it's like, well, why do we call the honeybee a honeybee? People often ask like, well, don't, do all bees make honey? But they don't, only honeybees make honey in large amounts, except for one exception, which is stingless bees in um, South America, which are really awesome. But they don't make honey in the quantities that honeybees do. And um, does anyone know why honeybees make so much honey? Um, they make all the honey they do because if you think about our different climates, um, honeybees live in places where honey is, or nectar for honey isn't always available. So collecting a bunch of nectar and storing it in their hive is their way to survive um, winter or dearth. So, you know, if honeybees are going through a period of like no rainfall, like right now, they're going through all of that honey in their hive that they've stored up. And then in the winter, um, they have those prolific amounts of honey in their hive so that over the winter months, they can consume that honey and survive the winter when there's not out foraging and gathering nectar on plants. Um, but yeah, honeybees are somewhat domesticated. They usually live in um, hollow cavities that are about, they prefer something like 40 liters big. Um, and yeah, it's funny, because when you see bees or feral colonies um, trying to find a home, you know, we'll find them a lot of the time in sprinkler boxes, like in the ground, because they kind of meet that like requirement of a hollow cavity, about 40 liters big, and there's like a little entrance that they can fly in and out of. So it's like the perfect little bee box. So we'll do a lot of bee removals from um, sprinkler boxes or meter boxes, or they'll get in people's walls. Um, but um, even with the honeybee, these are both Apis mellifera. So they're both honeybees, but you can see they're quite different, right? Um, there's also 30 subspecies of honeybees. And um, beekeepers will use these different subspecies just based on like need or environment. So um, on the left is Apis mellifera, mellifera, or the German black bee. You can see why it's called that. Um, these were actually the first bees that were brought to the Americas. Um, they were just the most common in Europe at the time. So when they brought honeybees over to the Americas in the 1600s, it was actually in 1622, they brought them to Jamestown. This is the kind of honeybee they brought. Um, and they're really acclimated, well acclimated to like cold weather in that northeastern climate. Um, and they did really well in the forest, but people said, throughout the word they used, they said they were just kind of defensive. They weren't the most gentle honeybees. Um, and so I'll talk about that more later, but this is, I think, um, Apis mellifera lagustica, the Italian honeybee. Um, but as far as like humans keeping bees, um, we have some evidence of people domesticating and keeping honeybees um, between 600 and 5000 BC. And Egyptians, we know, are some of the first 
cultures or peoples to um, keep bees. And the way they did this was like in little um, vessels that would sit inside of a wall. So there would be kind of like a jar sideways like this, and you can see a wall of them over there. I think that's in Turkey. But um, it would just basically be a jar, and they put a colony of bees in there, and they would build their comb and stuff, and they'd be able to fly in and out through a little entrance. And they would basically just kind of have to go in there and destroy the hive to um, get honey out. So um, that was kind of the first way people did beekeeping. And then I'm sure, I say, I'm sure you've seen this. Um, people that are really into bees talk about um, La Cueva de Araña, which is the cave of the spider in Spain. And they found um, this kind of depiction of someone honey hunting about 8,000 years ago, which is like so amazing. And so it's kind of the same thing where someone's going to a feral hive and they kind of have to destroy that hive and take it apart to get the honey out. And so um, that's also, I mean, that is called honey hunting, not beekeeping. Um, but it's still kind of similar because these people that were keeping bees in Egypt, um, they were kind of still disrupting that whole colony when they would harvest honey. Um, and then go forward to like 2,000 years ago in Europe, you know, we see all those cute little beehive skeps. Well, I think the reason we see them so much in art and culture is they use them for so long to keep bees. Those little, it's like an upside down basket. And so they would weave the basket and kind of like that vessel in the wall, they put the colony of bees in, they would build comb, and then they would just kind of turn that basket over and take out honeycomb when they wanted to harvest honey. So it was a little better. They weren't like, you know, honey hunting where they're just hacking off, you know, comb. Um, I think they just try to take out the honeycomb. But um, this was, I think, this isn't the picture from the 1950s, but if you go online, you can find people still using skeps um, in the 1950s. And skeps are something that also came from Egypt and were just, you know, prolific and spread throughout that area, north of Egypt into Europe. Um, so anyways, I talked about, you know, the 1600s, um, Europeans brought bees to Jamestown. Um, but yeah, oh yeah, that's the word they call them. They said they were excitable. <laughs> so I thought that was funny. That just means they were like defensive and a little more aggressive than they wanted. Um, and so later in the mid 19th century, so 1850s, they decided to bring in those Italian honeybees that I showed you earlier. But um, what's super, super interesting is back in, this is kind of a recent discovery in 2009, they found um, a fossilized honeybee here in North America. So they know, and that fossil was about 14 million years old. So they know that honeybees were in North America, died out, and then were reintroduced um, by the Europeans. So it's kind of like horses. We have those, you know, kind of horse-like um, animals that were here in North America, but they never evolved into the horses we know today. And then of course now we have horses um, that were brought over. So anyways, I'm talking about beekeepers destroying these hives and it being messy. Well, in 1852, there was a reverend in Ohio named Lorenzo Langstra, and he realized that it takes a lot of the bees effort to build comb. And every time they're harvesting honey, they're destroying a bunch of comb. And it takes, I think I put this down on here, maybe not, but it takes two to 14 pounds, depending on the time of year, of honey to make only one pound of wax. So you're taking a bunch of work and resource from that colony just to get honey because you're destroying all that wax. So what Lorenzo Langstroth did was he figured out a way that he could get removable frames in a hive. I should have brought a hive box, but it's like, it's basically like little frames all in a row that are held there in a box. And so you just take the frame out and you can inspect your bees and put it back without tearing up comb and disturbing the bees and making them upset. And so with honey, you're also able to grab that honeycomb, 
um, take the honey cappings off and put it in a spinner and you can spin the honey out and then actually put that comb back into the hive. So the bees aren't having to make that comb all over again, which takes so much energy, right? Um, so anyways, that's kind of a history of honeybee and beekeeping. And so now we'll actually talk about these amazing ladies. And so I'm going to talk about what honeybees do outside of the hive first, and then we'll talk about what's going on inside the hive. So I thought this was funny because I hadn't thought about it before until I was organizing this presentation. But literally everything that goes on outside of the honeybee hive has to do with reproduction. It either has to do with plant reproduction or bee reproduction at the individual or colony level. So, um, so bees outside the hive, it's all about fertilization. So um, this is a bee gathering pollen from this plant. And I'm sure you guys have seen bees out foraging and collecting um, pollen and nectar. So remember when I said pollen is their protein source? So when plants started having pollen, wasps, what was kind of turning into the bee at that time evolutionarily, was like, okay, well, we're going to gather pollen instead. That's going to give us protein. So what I did, I'm going to pass this around too, is... Um, I gathered some pollen from my hive. You can put a trap in the entrance and it actually knocks the pollen off of the bees legs right here as they're going in and you can collect it. And so all of the pollen in this jar is pollen that is straight from the bees knees. So <laughs> um, it's super cool. So you can just kind of look in there and see all the different colors. And of course, you don't want to keep a pollen trap on a hive very long because you're literally robbing them of all the protein that they're bringing into the hive. So here you go. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so these bees are, so I say it's about fertilization. You know, when a bee visits a flower and gathers the pollen, they like to go, you know, to that same flower, flower type, and they're transferring that pollen from one plant to another. So that cross pollination that's needed for many plants happens and they're fertilized that way. So, um, and then honeybees. So another time you see bees outside of the hive, this is something we probably wouldn't see with our eyes. But um, honeybees leave a hive not only to forage for nectar and pollen, but the queen has to leave the hive to go on her mating flight. So this is a virgin queen right here emerging from her cell. This is a queen cell and then this is the uh, queen bee coming out. And she actually has to leave the hive and fly really high up in the sky. I can't remember how many feet it is. And that's where she does her mating flight and finds male bees, which are called drones, and they actually mate while they're flying. And because um, there's kids here, I'll just keep it super simple, but um, there's a picture diagram of how that happens. And yes, there's an audible sound when the drone mates with the queen. Um, he dies because, um, yeah, the queen takes off with his sperm and everything basically and so he falls to the ground and the queen actually mates on this mating flight she'll mate with um 30 to 60 drones it really depends on the source you're reading how many she mates with but the more she mates with the better because that increases the genetic diversity within a colony and gives um them that diversity to um you know, overcome different diseases, perform different roles well within the hive. And so what's really cool is when you have wild feral bees in your backyard that have just wildly openly mated with a bunch of different drones, which is actually what this colony is. This queen was mated out in the East Mountains. But if you look at the bees, you'll see a lot of genetic variation just from one honeybee worker to another. You'll see some light colored ones and dark colored ones and super orange ones. So it's really neat to see, you know, just that diversity within one colony. And then another thing they do outside the hive is swarm. And I'm just going to show you a video of the bees swarming in my backyard last year, the year before. 
And we'll talk more about swarms later and why bees do that when we're talking about bees inside the hive. My bees are swarming. I was gonna split them today, but they're splitting currently in this swarm in our backyard. So I'm just hoping to God they land in an easy spot. It looks like they will. It's pretty magical though. I'm not, I'll admit, I'm uh, not too upset that they're swarming. Um, it's just so amazing. They're really clustered right here. I hope you can hear it. Um, yeah, it's so cool. Mm -hmm. It's it's so magical. Okay, so we're gonna move on to honeybees inside the hive. Well, first of all, has anyone seen a swarm? Like either on a tree or gathering? Yeah, you saw one like, on your car, right? And yeah. You're just like, wow. Yeah, so anyways, yeah. we'll talk more about that in a little bit, but honeybees inside the hive. So what's going on inside? So um, there's three different, I guess what you could call casts of bees that are inside a colony. Um, on the very left there is the queen bee and her sole job is to, like we said, outside the hive, she goes and mates with drones, comes back, and then she lays up to 2,000 eggs a day. That's all she does. The worker bees groom her, they feed her. Um, she is the egg laying machine of that colony. So she is the mother. And then next to her is a drone bee. And it's funny because the drone or male bee's only job is to mate with the queen. So in times of the year when they're running low on resources, they'll just start kicking those drones out. So like in the fall before winter, when there's not going to be bees out mating, you'll see the worker bees kicking out all of those drone bees, kind of in like late September, October. Um, and then on the very right is the worker bee. And the worker bee is the female bee in the hive, and she does all of the tasks that keep the colony going. And so... Um, the worker bee has a lot of different roles, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, all three of these casts have basically the same kind of development um, cycle. So they start out as an egg. And this is a photo my friend Christy got. It's such an awesome photo because you can see the eggs that the queen laid at the bottom of these cells in this wax comb. See that little white, like little rice looking thing? That is um, an egg that the honeybee laid, the queen bee, laid probably a day or two ago. When she first lays it, it sticks straight up. And then over the course of about three days, it starts to lay over. And then it hatches and a larva emerges from that egg. So that's the larval stage. So they go to that larva stage. And another cool thing about this photo is you can see that larva right here, that little white worm kind of in that royal jelly. See that white kind of milky mixture? So um, all the bees are fed royal jelly the first three days of their larval stage in development. And so that's why you see the eggs and then larva with that royal jelly. How long is the larval stage? It depends on if it's a worker, queen, or drone bee. So they are all eggs for three days, and then the life cycle development of these egg larva pupa stage um, differ depending on cast. And so, um, but anyway, so they're a larva, and then once that larva is capped, do you see these cappings here, kind of like brown? So that's the pupa stage. So like when a butterfly wraps its cocoon around itself and is inside of that, it's a pupa, right? And it's the same with a honeybee. That larva spins a cocoon within that wax that you saw, and then it's capped or covered with um, these coverings. And you can actually see that 
underneath these bees later if you look really closely it'll help you find like some capped brood in here um baby bees are called brood so this is considered open brood this is considered um capped brood and the lifespan um, does differ between the cast so a worker bee only lives about four to six weeks because they're out working all the time they're exposed to different things in the environment like pesticides and they're just working hard um, a drone it just depends you know are they born like early in the year where they can kind of like hang out and try to mate with a queen, you know, and maybe or maybe not get kicked out? Or were they born like close to September, October, where they're starting to kick out all those drone bees? So it really just depends with drones. And then queen bees can live two to five years, so they can live a while. But anyway, so we, you know, I'm saying that queen drones and workers, they all start out as an egg for three days. They're all fed royal jelly at the first few days of their life. So what the heck makes a queen bee a queen bee, right? Or a worker bee. Um, and it all is based on nutrition. And isn't it crazy? So nutrition affects developing bees so much that it determines their caste. So it, de it determines what genes are expressed. So, you know, we're talking more these days in biology about like epigenetics. So this is like all about that. So um, at some point, this is a queen cell with a queen larva in it. And what do you notice about this queen cell compared to like the worker cells that I showed you on this slide? It's more controlled. It's more controlled and it's like, like it's this huge bowl, mm -hmm. right? And the reason it's this huge bowl is because all of the worker bees that are nurses, which we'll talk about more in a little bit, it's hard to like not talk about everything all at once, <laughs> but um, the worker bees have hypopharyngeal glands that are like in their mouth parts and they secrete a protein called royal jelly, which I'm sure everyone's heard of because they've tried to market it for all mm -hmm. these things. But the royal jelly is full of protein and nutrients for these developing um, queen bees and the worker bees and the drones. But the queen has this huge bowl um, when she's developing called a queen cup or a queen cell. And that's just to hold a massive amount of that royal jelly that's secreted from the nurse bee's mouth. And so that's why they look so different. And so the queen's developing in here and this is where they start to differ. So um, three days into the larva, larval stage, the worker bees start to get fed a mixture of pollen and honey, which is called bee bread. And there's a little bit of a fermentation process that goes on there. But with the queen bee, she's fed exclusively royal jelly. And it turns out that um, the genes that are expressed when you start feeding bees um, honey and pollen, they turn into worker bees. So um, it's that kind of diet or nutrition that turns on those genes for them to be a worker bee and their ovaries don't fully develop um, like a queen bee does. And so that's all the females in the hive. What about the boys? So this is crazy. Um, the development and reproductive cycle of bees is totally different than us and like mammals. Um, male bees are actually only um, one set of chromosomes. And so they only get chromosomes from um, the mom. So she lays an actually unfertilized egg. So if she lays an unfertile egg, that egg turns into a male bee or a drone because it only has one set of those chromosomes. Isn't that crazy? And so another thing, you could go down a rabbit hole, but worker bees can develop ovaries if there's an absence of a queen and open brood. And they can actually lay unfertile eggs, because they've obviously not mated, like a queen would go out and mate. And they can actually lay male drone bees. So if a hive is dwindling and there's no queen, and they're kind of like petering out, those worker bees can still produce drone bees that can then go out and mate with queens and keep those other colonies in the area going. And so it's kind of like part of this survival thing that has developed at the colony level. Not just the colony level, but a species level like throughout um, 
an environment. So, okay, so workers. So like I said, there are guard bees, but workers tasked within a hive, so these female worker bees, they can change depending on the age of that worker bee and the needs of the colony. So most honeybees, um, the first job they have is kind of like a cleaner. So they'll emerge from that cell that they developed in and they have to turn around and clean that cell. That's like their first job. And then from there, they'll kind of go on and start doing like hygiene tasks within the hive. And earlier, I'm so glad someone saw it, um, there was a bee carrying a dead bee in this hive. So they're like trying to clean up and keep the colony clean and healthy. Um, and sometimes we call them undertaker bees. They'll carry out bees that have perished outside the hive to keep it clean and hygienic. Um, and then from there, they'll move on to a nurse bee role. And the nurse bees, like I said earlier, they're producing that um, royal jelly, right? So they're feeding all of the really young larvae. And they're also feeding um, the worker larva and drone larva, that pollen and honey mixture. Um, and so I am going to pass this around. That bee bread or pollen and honey that are mixed together. Um, it smells good. But you can see all the different colors. Um, this is considered the bee bread. So if you want to kind of, after we've talked about it, look at how those little round pollen pellets get turned into bee bread. They pack it in there and they mix it with a little bit of nectar and wax. And that's what makes this bee bread that you see inside the comb that's fed to the baby bees. So you'll see that around the brood. Like in a comb, you'll see brood and then the bee bread or pollen, and then you'll see nectar so that those nurse bees can get those resources and feed the brood in the middle. And then there's also builders. So that happens when bees are about 12 days old, and that's when they're able to secrete a lot of wax from their wax glands at the bottom of their abdomen. And so they'll make that wax, and then they'll take that wax and manipulate it and turn it into the comb that we're passing around. Um, and then there's also the foragers. So they're the older bees in the hive. And so they're taking more risks. And so they're leaving the colony and they're going and getting nectar and pollen to bring back to the hive. And then of course there's those guard bees that are making sure only who belongs comes in and everything else stays out. And that includes like mice, um, humans messing with the hive, skunks, etc. that might want to get in. So they do all those tasks throughout time? Not necessarily, but that's kind of the task based on age. But say like, um, say they have a col like a colony is totally full of comb, but there's like no honey and they're starting to hit a nectar flow, there's not going to be a lot of builders. So they might skip that stage and go straight from a nurse bee to a forager. So a lot of the organization within a hive and need are based on like pheromones, which is a scent that's shared among the bees throughout the hive. So like there's what's called brood pheromone. And so that spreads throughout the colony. It's kind of like their number way of communication is through scent. And they can smell like hundreds of times better than a dog even. And so that smell that's going around, that open brood pheromone is telling them, okay, we need a lot of food. We need more foragers. And so they'll go forage. So it's really amazing. Um, they communicate through smell. Yeah. Primarily. Is primarily, that yeah. Because if you think about a honeybee colony, it's about 60,000 bees in a dark cavity, in a dark closed space. And so their primary form of communication is through vibrations. Um, they dance, right? And that gets sends out vibrations and through the smell. And so there's various smells, even as a beekeeper, that you can see them emitting. There's like a nasonal pheromone where it's like a homing pheromone that the bees will actually fan out of the back of their abdomen, kind of saying, hey, ladies, we're over here, come this way. Which like when you're getting a swarm, if you get most of the bees in the box, 
they'll start emitting that pheromone, telling their sisters to um, come home into that box. So um, anyways, inside the hive, so it was talking about those builders, right? So this was actually at the Open Space Visitor Center off of Coors. This is springtime of the year. And so this is what's called festooning. So all the builder bees that have wax secreting from their abdomens, they hold on to each other and create like a scaffolding for them to make this comb and draw it out and build it. So I was telling y'all earlier, this um, bee, um, I was gonna say colony right here. This is only one bar from the beehive. There's about 20 in this colony right now. This is just one. But they made all of this from this wooden bar down is made from bees. So this is what they built. And what's cool is you could, I got a really good video of them like holding on to each other, doing this festooning so you can kind of see their hands. You can actually see them like holding on to one another as they're building. Cause as you're in a hive inspecting them, you're moving those bars apart. And so they're having to like hold on even tighter because you're pulling them apart. And it's really cool to see. So that's called festooning. That's part of building. And then honeybees within the hive. So everyone's interested in honey. Like how is this honey thing happening? So I said protein or pollen is their protein source. Honey is their source of carbohydrates. Um, and so I'm actually, when I'm done presenting, I'll let you guys taste two different honeys from different times of the year. Um, fall honey tends to be a lot darker and spring honey tends to be a lot lighter. That's just because the plants are different in spring and fall. So, you know, this is probably more chamisa, sunflower. This is probably more like winter jasmine, catmint, alfalfa maybe, things like that. Um, so anyways, honey production. So outside of the hive, the bees gathering pollen and nectar. You would think that the honey that the, or the nectar that the bee gathered would then be put into a cell by that same bee but it's not. That honey is actually, um, or nectar at that point, is transferred from the forager bee to another bee in the hive through a process called trophallaxis. So she transfer, regurgitates that honey into another bee's honey gut. And then that like starts this enzymatic process. So it's mixing with those enzymes in the bee's honey gut. And then that second bee is actually the bee that puts that nectar in the cell. And then the bees flap their wings and they reduce the water content, they dehydrate it. And once that water content is below about 15 to 16% water, they'll cap it. Um, and so you can see this is still nectar that's being dehydrated. And then this is honey that's ripened and ready and capped. So that's kind of the process of honey for bees. And then swarming. So why do bees swarm? Like why were my bees in my backyard just like flying around everywhere? So this is a swarm on a tree. I seriously think it's like one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Um, I don't remember what I have on my side. So one sec. Scouts already dancing on the outside. And they're telling the swarm of a location they found. So, when a colony is reproducing at the colony ball, um, the home cavity gets really full of bees, and so they need more space. And so, what usually happens is the old queen will leave that hive with about half of the workers and land on a nearby tree. And so that's why you'll see that kind of like cluster formed on a tree, car, motorcycle, bike, whatever. They've left the hive and landed nearby. And then on that swarm, you'll see scout bees kind of dancing around. 
And that's because the scout bees leave the swarm and they're scouting for a new hive location. And so um, it's amazing to see. So they find a location, come back and do a little dance to kind of share with their sisters about the location they found, where to go. And then their sisters will go and check it out. And then when they've all kind of come to a consensus on where is the best new place for um, a home, that swarm will leave the tree and go to that new cavity and start a new, you know, colony. And I, I say it's a new colony, but it's the old colony. And then meanwhile, you know, you still have half the bees in that original colony. So what they're doing is before Queen left, she laid in queen cups. Remember those queen cups we saw? She laid in those and the colony raises new queens. And then um, there's only one queen in a hive, right? So usually that first queen that emerges kills the other queens or they'll like battle it out in a battle royale. And then that queen that wins goes on the mating flight and starts that cycle all over again. So that's reproduction like at the colony level. That's essentially what um, swarming is. So um, how do we protect bees? So we know bees are important. I feel like as the public, we kind of all know like one in every three bites of food we eat, you know, we can thank the pollinator for that. Um, so how do we protect them? And um, so if you see a swarm, don't kill it. It's probably bees at their most docile state because they gorge on honey before they leave the hive. It's like a bunch of bees with full bellies just hanging out on a limb trying to find a home. So call a beekeeper, um, abqbeaks.com, click on, I think, swarm removal or something, and you'll see a list of phone numbers divided by area of town. And you can call a beekeeper to come and collect that swarm, and they'll put in a hive, and then they'll have a new colony, and the bees will have a new home. Um, but another thing you might see is where bees have already moved in somewhere. So that swarm already moved into someone's sprinkler box. So I went and removed them from the sprinkler box. So this is another thing you can do is call a beekeeper to remove established colonies as well instead of spraying them. Um, on the picture on the left, that was like a mobile home underneath a bay window. So all I had to do was like pop off that piece of wood, get the bees out, put them in my hive. Um, but yeah, it's, really important that we keep these bees because if you think about it usually swarms are some of the healthiest bees in an area because they've survived a winter and they've proliferated so much that they've reproduced and divided so they're really good bees um how is it that you actually do get to remove that from getting the so i wish i wish i put a picture of me during the removal um if you go to Desert Hives and M on Instagram and click on the removal thing on my page, you can see me doing some of these removals. But basically, you cut out the comb and then you put it in a frame with like, um, I use dental floss or rubber bands, and then I put it into a hive box. And once you find the queen and most of the bees are in the box, usually the rest of the colony will just kind of march in. Um, Sometimes you'll squish a few on accident. It's kind of inevitable with a messy removal. Um, sometimes you don't. It really just depends on like if you're having to grab into little nooks and crannies or not. So, um, this was under the floor of a shed. This was really cool. This is in my backyard. And um, there was a colony that built an open air hive in Albuquerque, which is pretty rare in our area because we have winters. But um, in areas with a more mild climate, you'll see more um, open air hives like this. So what I did was I cut the branch off and put it all together in a hive box so they'd be protected during the winter. And they actually made it. So it's been super exciting just seeing them like live and thrive. And then I just put a hive box with frames above it. So maybe eventually they'll move in and I can inspect them. Cause technically, you know, you're not supposed to have a hive with frames that you can't inspect. So my goal is to get them to move from these two boxes up to a box that I put at the top, if that makes sense.
Um, this one I thought was funny. <laughs> they were demolishing this house and had bees in the wall back here. And so once I had most of the bees in this hive box, I just left the hive box on the toilet until they all went in. And then I was like, okay, ladies, time to get off the pot. And then I took them home. And I just thought it was hilarious. And I didn't have to worry about how I cut into the wall because they were knocking <coughs> the home over anyways. But anyway, so how else can we protect bees? So plant bee-friendly plants. A lot of plants in the stores these days will um, be pre-treated with neonicotinoids. So just kind of look for that on the label and make sure they don't have it because if they do, they're going to emit that neonicotinoid pesticide um, in the nectar and pollen and then the bees can get that and take it back to the hive and get really sick. Um, what else? Setting up like a watering station, especially here in the desert, Bees need water to cool the hive. They actually take that water back to the colony, spit it out, literally, and then fan their wings to kind of have like an evaporative cooling system. So they need water. So you can do like kind of pebbles and a shallow bowl or something like that. And then of course, just don't use, you know, pesticides, especially like on flowering plants, because it's kind of like, if you spray, you know, Roundup on a flower, you're like saying, here little bee, and it's like, attracted to it and you're poisoning them. So these are kind of just some simple ways to um, help bees. I have heard people say I'm going to get a beehive in my backyard to save the bees and this is super unpopular for me to say but I'm going to say it but having bees and being a beekeeper does not help save the bees especially if you're not doing it properly. Um, you have to know what diseases to look out for and how to care for them properly, or you can do a lot more harm than good. So um, I think that's it. Um.